Good morning, uh, everyone. I'm um, delighted to be here, and I look very much forward to trying to entertain you for the next 45 minutes or so. So the title of the lecture is Why Screening to Predict Injury Does Not Work and Probably Never Will. But I've also added a second part to it, and that is why are we still screening that, uh, referring to Scott's comment here uh, earlier. I have no relevant uh, disclosures uh, apart from a love of sport, which I think believe we share, all of us. So the question is, all these screening tests that we are doing uh, to uh, assess the musculoskeletal system of athletes, can they help us to identify who the player is who will be carried out on a stretcher in a football game? Can we predict, identify who will get injured? And now a caveat, quoting my favorite uh, philosopher. Uh, so I warn you that there will be some, some, some heavy shit statistics in the beginning of this uh, talk. Probably the first 20, 25 minutes or so, I'll be talking about likelihood ratios, sensitivity, specificity, um, ROC, and uh, AUC curves. Nah, just kidding. <laughs> what I will do, though, is I will start uh, with this group of old gentlemen uh, and uh, a couple of younger ladies, as you see here. This distinguished group, uh, present company excluded, met and wrote this statement in 2009. And this is the IOC consensus statement on periodic health evaluation, which is a synonym for screening or pre-participation examinations. Um, and the question they addressed was why uh, would you perform a periodic health evaluation or a screening examination? Mm -hmm. And the statement lists a number of different reasons or potential reasons. One of them being to identify the high-risk athlete. Another could be to identify existing problems in athletes. Third could be baseline uh, data, gathering baseline data, to use that as a starting point for a training program or to use that as data you would use if the athlete is injured in returning him or her to play to see okay this was your test when you were healthy now we want you to get back there before you can play again an opportunity to review medications and supplements uh, this is obviously relevant with the anti-doping rules that we live by to establish a relationship with the athlete, if this is the f if you're going to take care of a team, uh, this could be an opportunity to establish, uh, uh, let him know who you are, and vice versa. And then, in some more litigious societies like the U.S., uh, sorry, Scott, uh, there is a uh, medical legal requirement uh, in some uh, organizations that this has to be done before you can participate in sport. So, let me start with the first one and that is the main topic of today, and that is, can we identify the high-risk athlete? <coughs> and what the consensus statement actually states, this is 2009, is that much research is needed before we can firmly conclude that screening can be used, screening tests can identify the athlete at risk. And they did recommend that PHEs, or screening programs, are set up and conducted as research programs, just like uh, Matt and, uh, and the crew uh, has done on the cardiac side of things since the beginning of establishing uh, cardiac screening here in uh, Qatar and at Aspatar. So what type of research is then needed to establish the value of screening programs? Well, in my mind, there are three research steps that are needed. The first step is obviously to identify potential tests that you could use. Or not just the tests, but the factors that you would like to use to say, well, this athlete is at risk, whereas this athlete is safe. He does not need a special program that we want to. So to define that cutoff value and identify the test, we would need first to find out what are those factors that we would like to screen for. And there are multiple prospective cohort studies identifying various risk factors 
for injury using different types of tests for anterior cruciate ligament injuries, for patellofemoral pain, for uh, ACL here again, and for hamstring strain injuries here. And I could have listed 100, 200, 500 papers. Classic prospective risk factor studies. So let's say that's fine. We have a lot of information about potential risk factors for various injuries in various sports and various populations. Now, my caveat here is that once you've done that, you need to do this again because your test properties will be overly optimistic in that first population that you use to develop the cutoff. So when you say, well, this is a cutoff that separates those who are good and those who are bad, we need to repeat that in a second cohort, in a third cohort, in a fourth cohort to verify that this test does the same thing in a more general population of athletes and especially the type of athletes that you want to screen. You don't know if a screening test that works for 16-year-old girls is going to work uh, in the same way for professional football players, obviously. So this has to be done in a population relevant to the one that you are, going, are planning to screen. So that is the second step. And now comes the third and crucial step. And that is to do a randomized control trial to test if a program that includes a screening pro com uh, component it is actually better than one without screening. So how would you go about doing that? Well, let me try and depict that uh, on the screen. So let's say you have a population of athletes. And in that population of athletes, you will see that some of the orange ones there, not showing that well on the screen, let's say that those are the individuals that are at risk and would be picked up by a screening test. Okay? But when you start to study, you don't know who they are. Then you randomly divide this group, not in just two, as we normally do in a randomized control trial, but actually into three groups. So here you see the three groups. And within that group, you will do a screening test on one group. That will let you know that some of these athletes are at risk, others are not at risk. All right? What do we do with the other groups? Well, we assume, since it's randomized, that there will be individuals with risk in all of those groups to the same extent as in the first group as well, but we're not screening them, so we don't know who they are. Okay? Now the next step is to take the group that we screened and use the information from screening and give the intervention that depends on the screening, the training program, whatever it may be, to the group that we have identified and not to the rest of the athletes, so they would not get any intervention. That's the purpose of screening, right? Identify the kids or the, the athletes that need this particular program. So this is our intervention. And what do we compare to then? Well, we compare to this, where there is no intervention in one group, but, and this is the important part, we also need a group where everybody gets the intervention without being screened. And then we look at what does this do to injury rate. And what is the expected outcome here? Well, I guess the argument would be this. This is what you would want, right? The group that is screened and gets the intervention to the screen players would have a lower injury rate than the group that has no screening and no intervention. Agree? Check. Problem solved. Or what about that third group? The one in the middle, where we give everyone the intervention. So what if this is the data that we come out that comes out at the end? That the injury rate is just as low in the group where we didn't screen, so we didn't waste money on screening, we just gave the program to everyone. And isn't this an possibility as well? That actually the injury rate then for that total group will be lower because we're giving the intervention to everyone, not just the ones who are screened. So my argument is, this is what we need to do to prove the value of a screening program that this is better than just an intervention program that we give to everyone. So getting back to the original tantalizing title then, why is screening for injury risk a waste of time? Well, it is a form of fortune telling, isn't it? We're trying to see what happens in the future. Uh, so it would be akin to saying, is it going to be a boy or is it going to be a girl? 
And another one of my favorite philosophers says on Twitter that I can predict the sex of an unborn child at two days into pregnancy with 50% accuracy. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to... S <laughs> Did that picture sneak in there? Sorry about that. Mm. So pretty much like flipping a coin, right? 50% chance of being right. Mm -hmm. So let's start looking then at some potential screening tests. And what is it that we would test by screening tests? Well, think about what we know about how injuries happen. And this is the classic model by Wille <coughs> Wille Moivisse, where he describes the causation of injury as a chain of events, in a way. So some athletes would be at risk for injury because they're characterized by some intrinsic risk factors. They're exposed to some extrinsic risk factors. And then shit happens and injury occurs. So the final event in the chain would be the actual injury mechanism of how the injury happened. Screening tests fit in here, right? They are about classifying the athlete according to his intrinsic risk factor pattern. And there are a number of candidate tests, obviously. I've listed some here. They're not random, but they are some of the key tests that are being used by international football clubs uh, around the world. Uh, and we know that from surveys that uh, have been done by Alan McCall and co-workers recently, that these tests are being used on professional players to predict injury and, and, and prevent injury. So basically, how do these tests work? Well, they work where you get it in this way. You get a screening score that is either low or high. And sometimes high is good and sometimes low is good. But what you do expect if you test a group of athletes is a bell curve distribution much like this. This is the number of athletes. So there's a lot of athletes in the middle. There are a few athletes who score very high and there will be a few athletes who score very low. Now imagine then that you follow these athletes for a period of time and some of them will become injured and others will not become injured. So I've now split the curve into two. The red ones here are the injured ones and the green ones are the ones who did not become injured. Now if this were my test, the question is where do I draw the line to distinguish those who are at high risk from those who are at low risk. If I draw the line here, I will capture 50% of the injured ones by the test, but I will also capture 50% of the non-injured ones by the test. So it would be pretty much the same thing as flipping a coin. And moving the cutoff value to the left is not going to help me much. I'm going to capture less, fewer of the injured ones, and also fewer of the non-injured ones, regardless of how far I move this. Moving it in the other direction means, yes, I'm going to capture more of the injured ones, but I'm also going to capture more of the non-injured ones. So this test would be pretty useless, wouldn't it, to screen for injury risk. But then let's see what happens if the groups are more different than this. So this is the original data. The p-value up here denotes that if there is a significant difference between this group and this group, and you can see that there is not. So we're back to the same data. This would not work as a screening test. But let's move this group all the way over here. So in th with this test, the screened ones score much less than, uh, no, the injured ones sco score much less than the non-injured ones. So you'd capture 99% of these by a test and only 4% of these by the test. So all of those who think that this would be a great screening test, please raise your hand. I expected to see all the hands in the air now. Yeah? Okay, you're doing better. So we'll play this game. Now what I've done is not move this group 15 points, I've just moved the group one point. And what happens then? Well, then it becomes statistically significant. So when you read the paper, you'll see, well, there's a statistically significant difference in whatever test this is between this group and this group. 
And a lot of people then will think, well, then we can predict injury. So let's put the cutoff value there. That is actually the optimal cutoff value for these points. And what happens? Well, 50% of the injured ones are captured by the test, and 40% of the non-injured ones are also captured by the test. So if you think, if you would use this type of a test as a screening test, please stand up. <laughs> Nobody. All right. Let's move it two points then. So now we have a highly significant difference between the two groups. This would be the cutoff value. If, you're gonna if you would like to, or you think that this is a reasonable test, screening test, please stand up. It would capture 61% of those who are injured, but also capture 42% of the non-injured ones. There's some guys standing in the back, but you were standing when we started, right? <laughs> All right. Three points then. Anyone? You're going to miss 40% of the ones who get injured. That's relevant here. And you're going to capture 40% of those who are not injured. Four points. Anyone? Five points. Stand up. You have to commit. Oh, and stay standing, please. <laughs> Six points. And stay. Mm -hmm. You have to commit now. Seven. So a few of you would actually accept the test where 20% uh, of those who get injured are missed and 20% of those who are not injured are captured. Right? That's reasonable, isn't it? Eight points. Nine points. And I would like everyone to know that at this point, the chair of the, of the screening department uh, stood up. <laughs> 10 points. OK, so that was it. <laughs> so this was playing with numbers. Now let's look at some real data for those candidate tests that I suggested in the beginning. Right? We'll start out with eccentric hamstring strength. And as you know, one of the landmark studies on eccentric hamstring strength as a potential risk factor was done here at uh, Aspatar, actually two of them uh, done here at Aspatar. And you probably all know the paper, and many of you contributed to the paper. And the conclusions in the abstract is like this. There was a significant factor, or, or um, quadriceps strength as well as eccentric hamstring strength were both identified as risk factors with p-values in this order, okay? And this is what the curves look like. So you're wise now, so you're not fooled by this, right? You want to see those curves, and they look like this. And mm, regardless where you draw, so anyone who would use this as a screening test to identify the player at risk of injury, please stand up. Uh, from what you've done before, I'm not expecting a lot of motion in the room at this point, right? So what we can learn from this is that a statistically significant association is very different from prediction. So association and prediction are two completely different sets of statistical uh, parameters. Let's look at the next one. That's functional movement screen, FMS, which has become incredibly popular all over the world, and which we also included in the screening battery here at Aspatar. And the question that we addressed, again, in the largest study of its kind in the world, here at Aspatar, was whether FMS works. You recognize this figure? It's the one I used as an example when I started out. There wasn't even a statistically significant difference between those who went on to get injured and those who did not. And that was the same regardless of which injury type we looked at in that paper. So this is now a classic paper in the literature. And there is a review that came out uh, just before this paper was published, actually, 
that clearly said that none of the movement screens that appear within the scientific literature currently have enough evidence to justify the tag of injury prediction tool. Now that this paper is out, I would say that uh, we now have the evidence to show that it does not work as an injury prediction tool. Some of you are involved in sports related to the upper extremity, so maybe you're interested in how what the shoulder sports uh, or shoulder problems, whether they can be predicted. And two of the common risk factors that are mentioned are range of motion and strength in the shoulder. Um, and we're fortunate because there are now two recent studies. There are other studies as well, but these are studies that were done um, where I work in Oslo, so I, I didn't really have to read the literature to make this, uh, this, this talk uh, much easier that way. Uh, and I also have access to the raw data so I can make some interesting figures. So they're done with two years apart uh, on an, uh, an elite population of handball players in Norway. The first one on males only, the other one on males and females. And the first paper published by Ben Clarsen showed that, yes, there is a statistically significant difference between the injured ones up here, not very many, small numbers, as you can see, and the uninjured ones in external rotation strength. So the injured ones were significantly weaker as a group compared to this group. But where do you draw the cutoff value here? And then the interesting point is also range of total range of motion came out as a risk factor. Again, those with less total range of motion were at more risk of injury than those with uh, a greater uh, total range of motion. But now comes my point that I started with in the beginning, and that is we have to validate these tests in a second cohort. So what happened when we applied the same method to the next group of athletes? No significant difference for external ra uh, rotation strength and no significant difference for total range of motion. So yes, in the first cohort there was an association, in the second cohort there was no association. I don't know why. We have to verify or validate these tests in other populations. So now comes the big one in many ways, and that is ACL injuries. And we know that uh, screening tests for ACL injuries are popular around the world. Um, and there's lots of opinion. And here's another one of my favorite philosophers. Um, he says, you can have your own opinion, but you can't have your own facts. So what I'm going to, to present now is the facts, and then you can have your own opinion when I'm done. One caveat, though. You know, the thing about quotes from the internet is that it's really hard to verify their authenticity, as Abraham Lincoln once uh, said. Hmm. So here's the test. The theory is that if you jump down, land, yeah, right, oh my gosh, look at the girl on the left here. She's totally out of control, isn't she? Lots of knee abduction and very little control. So we would say, well, this girl has, the, the purpose of testing would be this girl, you're good to go. You need lots of prevention training, otherwise you're going to tear your ACL. Right. That's the common. Um, and this type of testing was uh, pioneered by Tim Hewitt in, in the US. And this was based on his prospective cohort study of 205 athletes, of which nine went on to become injured. So remember those numbers, 205 athletes, that's a rather small group, one season, and only nine injuries. And what they did show was that the knee abduction ankle, so getting more into a knock knee position, was more prevalent in the group that went to those nine who injured their knee compared to the rest of the group, right? And the conclusion was bold, saying that these factors are key predictors of an increased potential for ACL injury in females. So you'd say, find that. This is the test to be used. Now, I took a closer look at the data, and this is how the data is presented in the paper. I made it easier to understand by restructuring the data in this way. So you, you're familiar with this type of graph now. This is the UIT data. This is the distribution, slightly skewed, skewed to the right here, so you have some individuals with pretty extreme knee abduction moment values over here. Uh, and then you have the familiar bell curve over here, but the outliers are here. So who became injured then? Well, this is the injured ones. 
so no surprise that there is a statistically significant uh, uh, difference between the blue ones and the rest. You can see that it's shiftly shifted slightly to the right. But where do you draw the cutoff value? If you say, well, if you're above this, you need prevention training, then you will have very few false positives, but you will have many false negatives. So you'll miss 89% of the ones who are injured. So you can move the cutoff value over here, which means that you're going to have very few false negatives. You're going to capture eight out of nine injured athletes, but you're also going to capture half of the other athletes in the population. So I said, where are we then? Well, we thought this is really interesting. We believed in this in Norway and started a larger prospective cohort study that went on for seven years in elite football and uh, handball players in Norway, so the top leagues in both of those sports. Um, and over the period of seven years, there were 42 non-contact non ACL injuries that we could analyze to see whether that particular type of screening test uh, could identify those at risk uh, or not. And this is the data. Absolutely no difference in new knee abduction moment between the ones with injury and the ones without injury. The Finns, our Finnish colleagues, did the same thing on a group of basketball and floorball players using the identical protocol to the one from Norway. They had, over a period of three years, 15 ACL injuries. This is the Finnish data. Absolutely no difference in the abduction moment between the ones with and the ones without injury. What they did find in Finland was another finding, though, that was the same as the original UIT study, and that is that the peak ground reaction force, in other words, the girls who land with stiffer landings, very stiff landings, that this was higher in the ones that had an injury and the others. But then we looked at the Norwegian cohort, and there was no difference. So again, I'd like to emphasize the need to validate screening tests in the population where you intend to use the test. It might very well be that the test works well in 16, 17-year-old scrawny high school players in the US, but it cannot be used in an, a population of elite, some professional, some semi-professional uh, football and handball players in Norway, clearly. So where are we then? Yeah, I've run out of tests, haven't I? But what if we use a risk factor that is a much stronger risk factor for injury than any of these tests? So what is the strongest risk factor for injury? Coach. Yeah, you've heard me before, so <laughs> cheating, a coach. He's a good coach, uh, no doubt about that. Uh, but I guess from the scientific literature where we have evidence is previous injury. Previous injury is always, for every injury type, is the main risk factor. And I picked one study from Iceland, an older study, the reason I picked it is that the odds ratio here is seven. And that's an incredibly high odds ratio between those who had a history of previous injury and those who, who did not. So this is really impressive, but what does that mean from a screening perspective? Well, this is another way of looking at the data. So here you have the ones that at the start of the season said, yes, I've had a previous injury, I think within the last 12 months or something like that. Uh, and there were 74 of them. And this group here is the ones who said, no, never injured my hamstrings before. There were 442 of them. And this is who became injured. So there's nine injuries in this group and there's 10 injuries in this group because there are so many more athletes here, the odds ratio is seven. So if we use the strongest risk factor we know of, history of previous injury to predict to get injured, 86% of our predictions will be correct, but we'll miss half the cases. So half of the ones who had a hamstring injury would be said, no, you're fine, you can go ahead and play. And that's with an odds ratio of seven. And I think it's really unlikely that we'll ever find a test, one single screening test, that will produce an odds ratio of more than seven, to put it that way. So I guess, from a screening perspective, you might as well ask if you had an injury before or not, but even that, is not going to be good enough to be a key component in an intervention program. 
And the question is, of course, why? Why is this so difficult? Well, you saw this, this model at the start of my talk. Injury is a result of complex interactions between in <coughs> internal factors, external factors, and the actual things that happen in sport, the injury mechanisms, if you like. And this is the simple model. Since then, we've had more complex models, and I can show you at least two or three models, including the Bittencourt uh, model. Uh, so the problem is shit happens in sport. There are factors that you cannot <laughs> account for. This would never show up on the screening test, would it? <laughs> so that's pretty depressing, isn't it? We can forget about all the screening programs, uh, according to, to Barr here. But then you'd say, well, in other fields of medicine, we have lots of screening tests going on. We have screening programs for breast cancer, for prostate cancer, for cervical cancer, for stroke and cardi uh, cardiovascular uh, disease. But what are the interventions? That's pretty serious shit, right? So it's not like you want to do this to all women. At least I don't want to do this or this to happen to all women. So the costs and the side effects of the interventions that depend on these screening tests are limit our ability to give this to everyone. But what is the intervention in sports medicine to prevent injuries? It's this, or this. And we have data to show that on the group level, if you give it to everyone, they work. There are now three studies giving about the same result in terms of how much you can prevent ACL, no, hamstring injuries in football, to give one example. So the point is, the difference between other medicine and sports medicine is that screening tests in other medicine is to restrict certain treatment to a few individuals and only those who need it. Whereas in sports medicine, the cost and time and so on and discomfort of doing this is so small that you might as well give it to everyone. So we're screening to restrict something from all the players, even the players who might benefit from it. And much of the training that is done to prevent injury will also increase performance. So there's the side effects are even positive in sports medicine. So the summary so far is that none of our current screening tests are accurate enough and can predict who will get injured. But importantly, injury prevention interventions should be aimed at group, the whole group, the whole high-risk group. So girls playing handball, they should all be doing ACL prevention. Boys playing football should all be doing hamstring injury prevention programs. So basically what I'm saying is, you can forget this point. This is not an argument for a screening program identifying the high-risk athlete. So why do it then? Well, can we identify existing problems? The question is if a, an MSK screening program can identify current musculoskeletal problems or other relevant conditions, that would be beneficial to identify to help the athlete. What is this? This is an MRI taken of one of our snowboarders in Norway in screening, post-season screening, one of the Olympic candidates. She had fallen, she had a little bit of pain when she fell, but she'd been uh, skiing or skating or whatever you call it, snowboarding, the rest of the season and wasn't really complaining that much of this pelvic fracture when she came in for screening. That would not have been identified, probably, if it hadn't been for the screening exam. And we have the data here from Aspitar, where over two seasons, the benefits of screening have been um, tested by looking at what is captured in the screening department in terms of medical conditions uh, that athletes uh, may or may not have. And in this paper, the definition of a health condition is any condition that needed treatment, further assessment, or 
some sort of recommendation to follow up with uh, health personnel. And the result was that 96% of the players had at least one health condition that was identified during the screening. Many of them were vitamin D deficiencies, as we know, but there were eight cardiac abnormalities that were followed up. There were 32% of them had musculoskeletal conditions that were followed up. So yes, a screening program detects musculoskeletal problems in one out of three players. The question is, of course, shouldn't we already know about them? So if you're the doctor of that team, except the new players that come into the team, the old players, you should know about them, right? So let's have a look at some data from across a number of different sports. And this is the Norwegian Olympic uh, screening program. And the question is, why is Norway still screening the Olympic and the Paralympic athletes? Well, there are a number of challenges in taking care of athletes like this on an ongoing in an Olympic program on an ongoing basis. First of all, there's lots of small teams, at least in Norway. We don't have, you know, a hundred archers. We have maybe one archer or two archers, and there's maybe not a medical team there even. Athletes live all over Norway, travel constantly, live all over the world actually, and travel constantly. And the professional ones relate to multiple medical teams. So the cyclists, for instance, they have medical care from the Olympic Training Center, from the national team, uh, doctor and medical team, from their professional team and club, and maybe even from the doctor, a doctor or a medical team in the town or city where they live, in Norway or in France or in Monaco or whatever. So there's no one really responsible for the athlete. And this is one of the reasons why this screening program was instituted, very much based on the model from here, uh, here at Aspetar with a number of different tests. I won't go into detail, but I'll share the data from the Rio team. So this is testing one year prior to Rio. And as you can see, it's not a very small, a large team, but there's a number of different sports involved and many of them small with few athletes um, as uh, Olympic or Paralympic candidates. And what did the data show? Well. At the time of screening, much like here, almost 90% had one or more health problems. More among the Paralympians than the Olympians. 58% of them had some sort of musculoskeletal pain problem or overuse injuries. 12 had a current acute injury at the time of screening. 52% of them had an illness that includes asthma, allergies, which they were screened for. More than half of them had a positive finding on general medical examination, and 11 of them had abnormal cardiovascular uh, findings. They were eventually all cleared to participate, but, um, uh, but there were abnormal findings there. Two of them were using unknown medication, and this is Olympic athletes where the WADA code is extremely strict, right? Three of them were using non-approved nutritional high-risk supplements, and eight of them were actually advised to change their nutritional supplement use because of the risk of contamination uh, and anti or, or doping, inadvertent doping, I should say. Ten of them had previous injuries that were found not to be fully rehabilitated, and this is one example, one of the football players who had a 30% strength side-to-side uh, -side difference in strength five years after an ACL injury which would, was not known at the time. So we're not surprised by these findings. We think that this, this is pretty normal. We now have similar findings from Aspetar and uh, Norway, but they do highlight the potential for existing conditions to be unknown in some cases, or known but just poorly managed in other cases. And the screening represents an opportunity to, uh, to uh, rectify that. So I'd say, yes, identifying existing problems is one reason to uh, perform uh, screening examinations. Baseline testing, there are a number of different purposes where these tests can serve as baselines for training programs or RTP, as I uh, said in the beginning. We have shown that this review of medications and supplements is very important in this group uh, and this is for the medical team taking care of athletes going into an Olympic Games and a very good opportunity to get to know the athletes and 
and importantly, get the athletes to know you. Um, it's not good if the first time you meet is in London during the uh, games, or in Rio during the games, or in Tokyo during the games. So, this is the end, I promise you. The take home messages are pretty simple. Screening is a valuable tool to optimize athlete health. But you need to know why you're doing it. Don't try to predict future injuries. Screening can identify existing ones, but this looking into the future part is overrated in my opinion. And since there is minimal cost, minimal discomfort, and maybe even the positive side effects from the training programs that can prevent injuries, this should be target all athletes and should not be based on a screening exam. And at the end here, I'll take the opportunity. I'm just showing three of the studies that I've referred to in this, uh, in this presentation. But there's now a series of papers coming out from ASBITAR from the best done and largest prospective cohort studies that are out there, especially as they relate to professional football. Um, I think there, yeah, there's a whole bunch of papers now that deal with this issue of screening and how MSK testing and Matt and his team have written and are writing extensively on the value of cardiac screening. Um, and I think that if we look back to 2009 and where I started with this statement here, where it is recommended that screening programs are set up and conducted as research uh, projects, I think it's fair to say at this point that we, and when I say we here, it's all of you who have been doing the work, the NSMP teams who have collected injury data and participated in screening, uh, all the doctors and physios and everyone else who has been involved in the uh, screening department, in the rehab department, testing the th these athletes and providing this data, and the researchers who have done the math and the statistician who has been advising them, and the senior management that has been supporting this all the time, I think this is a time to congratulate yourself for a job well done. In my mind, there's no doubt that the world currently looks to Doha for advice on the question of the benefits of screening. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>